Every, hello, everybody. Hello. How are you doing? Okay. Had a good week. Yes. Is it, here we are back again because we realize that we cannot sustain ourselves. We've got to be sustained by the power of God. God expects us before we do anything to check in with Him so we can receive his motivation, we can receive his blessing, and above all we can we should receive his direction. The worst thing you can do is go without being under the direction of God. God expects his people to be submissive to his will. God expects his people to wait on him for direction, for guidance, and for propulsion. Unless we repel and set out by the spirit and power of God, we're not going to be able to be successful in carrying out God's purpose, God's plan, and God's will for us. So here we are, back at the source of supply and the place from which our blessings flow. All blessings flow from God. Matter of fact, our blessings come from God. For our blessings to flow, they first have got to come. And they got to come to vessels that are open and ready to receive the infusion and the supply of God's Spirit. How willing are you, brethren, today to receive what God has for us? Do you run on your own power? Or do you rely on God for his direction, for his supply, and for his infusion? We do nothing of ourselves. We do nothing for ourselves. After all, we are simply instruments in the hand of God. And if and when we understand that, then we can fully function because we realize that we can do nothing of ourselves, but only if God directs us and if God sees fit and best so to do. In the book of First Peter, chapter 2, and beginning at verse 9. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. First Peter 2 beginning in verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Do you this morning feel that you are these things? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And he leaves the best for last. A peculiar people. Uh, do you feel peculiar? I don't mean eccentric. I don't mean off the deep end, but peculiar, different, what God would have you to be. When you walk the streets of New York or ride the servers and drive on its highway, do you feel, yeah, I'm unique, I'm different. That's not being proud, eh? that's, being, that's being peculiar. You are called of God. Do you know and understand it? What that means, that God took his time. God, who is a spiritual being, he took his time to call you. The next question is, why you? Who are you? Are you that important? Yes, brethren, get it in your thick head. You are important to God. You have been chosen of God. 
You are the chosen generation. That's what the scripture says. A royal priesthood. Well, no, I'm not a priest. I, I can't be free. I'm telling you what God designates you are. A, a chosen generation. This is your time. Remember what Esther was told? You've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is your time. What are you doing with it? This is your opportunity. This is your generation. This is now for you. It's like when the, the stars in their physical realm have to go on. So much that goes on behind the scenes. And then the floor director points to the speaker and says, means you're on. Brethren, we are on. This is our time. This is our generation. This is our opportunity. Depends on what you do with it. It depends on where your resources come from. If your resources come from your scholastic preparation, let's see how long that will last. Unless you are plugged in, unless you are connected to the source of inspiration, unless you are connected to the support, the, the supply of spiritual ignition, it depends on how much your battery is charged. If your battery is plugged in this morning, it means you only have juice for a short space of time. But if you are continually plugged in to the source of your spiritual supply, it means you can run endlessly. It means you can run for a long time. So it pays to be plugged in. Should I spend the time and ask you, are you, are you plugged in? Are you dependent on God? Or are you dependent on your scholasticism? Are you dependent on your, well, I, I know it all. That need not be the attitude. The attitude has got to be, unless I am connected to the support and the source of my spiritual direction, my spiritual source, my spiritual connection unless I am plugged in. Do you see how meticulously the gentlemen who work with the microphones and with the camera and with all the other physical amenities that make this situation and this system run smoothly, do you see how diligently they are? Do you go about your spiritual life with that same diligence? You should, because that's the only way you can, should I say, pull it off. That's the only way you can do it. That's the only way when you are told, ah, you're on, you're ready to go. That calls for constant supply. That calls for being plugged in and ready. Are you ready? And if you are ready, when the director points you to, you're on. You don't then just say, I, 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 give me a couple of more minutes. No, you should be plugged in. You should be anchored. You should be ready to go. Are you ready to go? Did you come here this morning? Your lamp trimmed and burning. Did you come here this morning saying, Lord, I'm an empty vessel? Empty does not mean totally discharged. Because you've got to be always plugged in. You've got to be a child of God when you come in here to a degree. But you come back to your source of supply and saying, Lord, I'm your servant. I need more supply. I need more fuel. When you leave your house to travel to the Poconos, eh, further down, let's say Florida, 
You need to know when you leave your place, you have sufficient gas in that tank to take you way down the road. Because you know that there are service stations along the way, well spaced, and you can get a supply, an infusion of fuel to take you down the road. What happens if the service station you're counting on, you see, I, I, I know here yeah, there there's a station on there. When you pull it there, they're out of gas. They're in the same condition you're in, nearly out of gas. Do you have enough to roll to the next station way down the parkway? You've got to count the costs. You've got to make ready for any eventuality. And if what you're banking on is not there, to a degree, because you can always bank on God. God will be there. But are you ready to take the torch and run with it when it's handed to you? Brethren, the torch is handed to you today. Are you a worthy representative of God? Can you run on the fuel you have in your tank? As a matter of fact, how much fuel do you have in your tank? That's up to you to know. You left home this morning. Well, it's pointing to E. But I hope when I get there, I get some infusion of fuel that can fill my tank up to the brim that it's coming out at the place where I put my fuel in. It must be full to the brim. So I ask the question, how filled are you now? Well, I, I'm not that full. That's understood. Because this is the place you come to get your tank topped off. When you left your house this morning, you ought to have been in contact with the great creator. You ought to have been in contact with your savior. Maybe I should ask, how many of you left your house this morning? You called on God. You sought God. You had a relationship with God and that you were coming here to be refilled, to be resupplied, to be resaturated, to be recommissioned, to be sent out, topped off. The tank is filled. It's coming out the place where you put in the gas in. It's all, it's all coming back through here. That's how fair you ought to be. But what about from the time you left home? Uh, did you have an argument with your wife? Were you in good spirit? So you left home in God's spirit. But that guy on the parkway had me mad. <laughs> Is that your attitude? You're so highly incensed that the slightest thing set you off. And depending on the depth of Christianity you have in you, do you still use foul language? Somebody gives you a bad drive to you, condemn him to hell, or do you ask God for grace? Do you ask God to help you to keep your driving skills at par, so that if you're given a bad drive by somebody, with his grace and with his help and with your internal skills, you're ready to deal with whatever. Maybe I should stop you and ask, do you pray before you leave the house? Do you pray when you get to the car? My wife and I do that. Not that you're playing Mr. and Mrs. Spiritual, but that's where your strength lies. Wherein does your strength lie? Remember the story of Samson. what Delilah did. She asked him, 
Wherein does your great strength lie? Aditha, this is a woman of the world, I can deceive her. Oh, my strength lies in if you tie my hand with uh, like ropes. Because he knew that his strength will be greater than the light rope to which he tied his hand. And he told her that, yeah, hey, that can keep us out of my children, all right, with that. She tied his hand to flax, breakable reeds. And she said the magic word, Samson, Philistines be upon you. And with the raising of the hand, the flax broke. God at that time. He did not stop to realize that, wait a minute, why is this woman so insistent on finding out where my strength lies? That's not a put down of women, but like the devil, he wants to know where is your great strength. My great strength is in my voice. I may think it's my ability to move my arms. Neither of those. Your great strength ought to be resident in God's spirit. How much of the measure of God's spirit do you have? You want to say, well, <laughs> measure of God's spirit I have is dwindling down. You don't know what kind of week I had. Oh, those people on the job. That's why you got to be filled with God's Spirit because of those same very people on the job. They're going to try you. They're going to test you. You don't know the wife I have. All of those are tests for the husband I have. That is why you need to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God so that no matter what the enemy throws at you, you will be fortified. And be like Jesus in John 4, filled with the Spirit and led of the Spirit. For you to be filled with God's Spirit, you got to be submissive to God's way of life. <clears throat> How selfish are you? How much of your way do you still have? How dependent are you and God for God <laughs> to guide you? The question is, does God's Spirit know you? You are so rebellious and self-contained. God's Spirit has nothing to do with you because you feel <coughs> you can do it all on your own. Unless we come to the end of ourselves and realize it is not I, it is not my brilliance, it is not my scholastic education that does it. Only thing that does it is your dependence on God and letting go and letting God. How much does God control your life? When you use the word control, you don't mean, mean well, you know, He controls every action I take, everything I do. It simply means. Are you submissive to God? Are you letting God direct you as to where and how you should go? Are you so carnal? Are you so carnal? That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. You are carnal. For whereas there is among you envy. Is there anyone here today that has envy? Whereas there is among you strife and self-will. Brethren, that's why we come to God's Sabbath service every week. So we can be purged of our selfishness. <clears throat> we can be purged of our self-righteousness. We can be purged of our sin. Because don't forget, Satan has not given up on you because you made a profession to follow Christ. 
As a matter of fact, he is more on your trail. <laughs> he might already be in your trailer. You must be willing to realize that unless your dependency is on God, not foolishly, not, uh, I hope, I hope God is working with me. No, you should know that God is your Savior through His Son, Jesus Christ, and that your dependency, yes, your reliance is on Him. And if you rely on God, providing you've done the proprietary work, submission, up to date in your spiritual life, not that you get to the place and you say, well, I'm dependent on God and God says, who are you? <laughs> Remember the story in Acts? The sons of Siva? They saw the apostles doing great miracles and they thought, we can do it too. The Spirit said, Paul, I know. And the other disciples of Jesus Christ, I know, but, <laughs> but who are you? How would you like the Spirit of God to say to you? Who are you? I don't know you. I didn't know you yesterday when you were carrying on in the office. I didn't know you at the beginning of the week when you were like, ah. And now you come here and you want to play as though you have so much of God's Spirit. Brethren, your life has got to be consistent. I don't curse at my wife during the week and then come here before you and, and, and pretend to be this white and sepulchre. We've got to live consistent lives because we don't know when Christ is returning. We don't know the length of our lives. So we need to daily have our lives in submission to God. You cannot be cussing out your wife, cussing the people at the job, carrying on we would say in Trinidad like a black hat. And then come before God's people as though you're a saint. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> we are called in the Bible saints of God. Are you saintly in your behavior? Are you submissive to God that God can use you? like the Spirit says to the son of Siva, Paul I know, Peter I know, <laughs> but who are you? And we've got to always ask ourselves that question, who are you? And unless you can say, well, I am prepared to be always submissive to God. I am prepared to do the will of God in my life. As a matter of fact, as far as I know, I am doing the will of God in my life reading God's word. I'm up to date in my prayer. You can always use more prayer. I am a burning and a shining light. Unless you're there, you're not going to be the kind of witness and the kind of representative as you are today. How much of a representative of God are you? Somebody used to say, if you want to know how spiritual a man is, <laughs> ask his wife. She knows how he behaves toward her. And the question can be reversed to the husband. How spiritual is your wife? Don't forget, you're supposed to be the support for your husband. You're supposed to be the emboldening and the supportive beam in your husband's life so that you can call on him when you find him. Honey, you're not reading as much as you used to read. You're relying too much on yourself. Not that she wants to intrude in your life, but remember, your life is an open sepulchre to how she's seen you. You're usually 24 hours a day. She's seen your attitude. 
She has seen your attitude to God's church and to God's people. She hears how you criticize them. So, fearing all of those things, isn't it better to have your life in complete submission to God so that when you get home, your husband doesn't look at you different now? Or your wife will get you different now? You're the spiritual one. I'm not putting ideas in your hands out there, brethren. But your life should be submissive and your life should be an open book in the sight of God. So that when you go to God, then you go as an empty vessel, not vanquished completely, but your batteries need charging. You ought to be needing charging now where you are. That's why you come here, to God to recharge your batteries, recharge your life, recommitment. It doesn't mean that you're expanded completely, but because you know you're running low on your charge, you come here to God. Hopefully that God's minister can inspire you. You want to have a sense of regeneration in your mind. Because you get this every day, you go to God in prayer. Hopefully you have that kind of a relationship to God so that when you go to Him and say, Lord, I'm empty. I'm running on low. I need a fresh infusion. I need a new supply of your spirit. I need indeed the mind of Christ. I allow myself to get away this week. I was off track. I need to be brought back to the place where I am in sick. If you call it sympathical with Christ. Lord, I need to be more like Jesus Christ. Lord, I need to be more like you. That is the objective. God is coming back in the person of his son for a prepared people. You remember the story of the ten virgins? It's a lesson for us. Ten virgins were called to go to this marriage supper. And they got to the place. They had all of the things, they got the right garments, their hair was done, the virgins, I guess that's meaning ladies. I guess the nails were done, if they did nails in those days, even the two nails. Ha! Huh. You didn't expect that, eh? But it shows that preparation was made for the coming bridegroom. left your house this morning were you all prayed up were you in sympathetic with God were you in readiness so that when you come here you already have a certain level of spiritual infusion simply come here to have an additional supply of the spirit of God or does your spirit supply and when you leave church, then you go out there and face the world. Oh, you don't know what I did this morning. The only preparation you can have to out there is being filled with the Spirit of God. The Gospel of John, it says that Jesus being filled with the Spirit. Before, was led of the Spirit and then about the 15th verse he returned in the Spirit of God. Note that those divisions. First, you fail. That's up to you. You know how filled your cup is today. You know where your level is in that jar. Is it filled? Or do you allow the people on the job to so get you annoyed that you even find yourself saying things you are not upset? And I'm not that spiritual, Mr. Morris. You ought to be. God expects you to be his representative 
on the job every day. You don't leave home without having on the, the, the garment of righteousness. You don't leave your house with a hole in your pants. You don't leave your, 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 your home with holes in your dress. No, you leave your home well dressed and well decked. Because you don't want somebody in the street to say, oh, there's a hole in your dress. Look at your pants leg, it's not hemmed. You leave your house with a certain deportment. Remember your mom saying that? With a certain level of readiness. You come here to be refilled, to be re-infused, to be recommissioned. That means attitude. You don't come to God and say, eh, what could the preacher tell me? I know it all. No, you are come here with an attitude of submission. Lord, whatever your will is for me, help me to be able to be at that level where you can still get through to me. Can God get through to you? Or are you that bullheaded that you think you know it all? You must be at that place where God can whisper. There's not to shout. Whisper. You're so attuned to the voice of God, to the mind of God, to the presence of God, that God can whisper and you will hear Him. That means, brethren, you need to be in constant readiness, in constant preparation. You shouldn't come here after arguing with your wife in the car, fretting, fussing, hopefully not cussing, but in the attitude of someone who is called of God, who respects God's Sabbath and come here with an open mind to accept and do what God has in store for me right now. You don't come here and from the time you get back outside the door, you're fretting with your partner, you're fretting with your wife, you carrying on with your husband, just having left the house of God. How much of God's spirit do you have? Do you come here with an attitude of receptivity? Do you come here saying, Love, I've been off the rail. Attitude is not the best during the week. But I come here to be corrected. Do you know, brethren, that you ought to be in an attitude of receiving the correction of God? The question is, can God get to you? Are you so close up tight. Did God want to know? And who are you? God should know you, brethren. He should know your attitude. He should know where you are spiritually. The question is, where are you spiritually? Are you receptive, open to the mind of God? Did you forget? that you're following Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that your attitude ought to be submissive to His guidance, or are you too big and Mr. Muck him up that God cannot get through to you? You see where I'm going? Your spirit, your attitude, your manner ought to be that of, what did Jesus say? Lest you be like these little children. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And when you look at a little child, mm. depending on the age, children today are so bombastic and self reliant. The age of computer science. We've got to be like children, small children, who can be guided 
who can be directed, who can be pointed in the direction that they need to go, and then go in that direction. Don't leave where you point them to go and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. Is that your attitude today? Or do you come here on a Sabbath with the spirit and the attitude of, well, let's see what God is going to tell me today. Let's see what God is going to show me today. And then when you come here, have the attitude of receptivity. Am I receptive? Or am I antagonistic? I know it. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. No. We're going to come with a childlike attitude of submission. Readiness to learn. Readiness to do. It's one thing to hear. But the other thing is have an attitude of willingness to learn and to do. Doing the will of God is after all what's important to God. You can know it up here in your head. You got it. You're brilliant. You're great mind. The question is, are you willing to do the will of God? And that calls for the spirit of Christ. That calls for the spirit of submission. It calls for a childlike attitude. At least when we knew what little children did, I don't know, generation is going to be the age of the child. We have some children today that are so bombastic, that are so self righteous, that are so not willing to learn, too far as attitude toward God, truth is concerned. Hopefully, that's not you. Oh, that's not you, isn't it? We must come here willing to do God's will. You know what God's will is. You've been coming to God straight for a long time now. The question is, are you doing God's will in your life? And until and unless we are at that point, we are not going to be where God wants us to be. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9 This is filled with pregnant with God's truth. But you are a chosen generation. Does that thought break through in your mind? You are of a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation. Listen to the, the stacking of categorizations that Peter does here. You are a chosen generation. One, a royal priesthood. <clears throat> a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. How many divisions does he pile one on top of the other? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Four various categorizations that he puts on here. Holy nation, chosen generation, royal priesthood, a peculiar people, all of that. Why? That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you. Do you deep down within you believe that God has called you? Or do you believe, well, I like this church, it seems to me, uh, you know, it's different. You're not chosen because you want to be different. You're different because you've been chosen. You get the difference. And as you submit to God, because God has chosen you, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. All of that you are. Do you feel like that this morning? I really got up and dragged today. 
I had a hard week. Or do you feel enthused? Do you feel you're a chosen generation? You're a chosen person. You didn't just by hunch, hunch, find yourself in God's church. God doesn't put trash in this church. God puts in this church people that he is called because they have lots of work to do. And that work begins now. Holy generation, royal priesthood, a peculiar people. I have a sermon somewhere on God's peculiar people. That's what we are. God's peculiar people. You don't have to be like the people in the other church over there or the people like that in the church down the street. You are a peculiar people. You're God's chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. And what's all of these things building for? That you should show forth the praises of him who would call you out of darkness. Didn't just call you out of darkness and have you standing there in a semi-darkness. No. That you should fall out of darkness into his marvelous light that you should show forth the praises of him back to the top of the earth who would call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does that apply to you? Do you feel like that? You've been called out of darkness. You've been called to understand the truth of God. Do you relish what you know? What God has revealed to you? Or do you treat it like, eh, I say, better, the more you think of yourself, not foolishly, proudly, but with a certain degree of pride. God has called you. Who me? Yes, you. God has called you. Because you are of a chosen generation. A peculiar people. To be a part of his royal priesthood. Yes, that's all in reference to you. That you should show forth his praises who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do you beam with the light of God? Or is your like the ten virgins when the bridegroom was announced to be here, then they scrambled. The time prior to his coming down, man, I'm all right. And when they realize they have to face the bright light of God's conviction, what did they say? Give us a your Lord, give us a your heart. All arts are going out. What about the time before the bridegroom came? What were you doing? Reverend, that's the time we are in. Yeah. We're in the time prior to the breaking of the clouds in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't wait until the clouds are broken and Christ is descending and say, ah, uh, I, I need to have gotten rid of this healing will. I needed to have gotten rid of this prejudice. I needed to be on a different spiritual plane. I wonder if he'll accept me. Brethren, those things are to be settled now. I would never if you'd be mad at me because I was mad at my wife this morning or mad at my husband this morning. You ought to get those things straight now. So that when the king comes back, when the king of glory has been declared to be here, you're not going, oh, do I have on the right garment? Are my feet short with the preparation of the gospel of truth? Is my heart right? Is my mind stable? All of those questions ought to be dealt with before that fatal moment. Brethren, that's why we give these Sabbaths and two week to come here where God works, where God is working to make sure we get our attitude, 
our spirit in alignment with God. We are in sympathico. We are together. I'm on the track that God wants me to be on. If I'm not there, I strive to be there. I strive to be what He would have me to be. You know what God would have you to be? It's all spelled out in His Word. You will behave like you are a, a part of the chosen generation. You are a part of the royal priesthood. You've been redeemed from darkness into God's marvelous light. And that's how you ought to walk every day. You not need, shouldn't be scrambling. I don't think I have on the right garment. No, I didn't put my shoe on right. Is my tie right? All of these things have to be prepared and done before the bridegroom comes. We're in the waiting period now. We're in that holding pattern. At any moment, it could be announced. The bridegroom is here. Go ye out to meet him. That's not the time to know, oh, I didn't get the right dress or the right suit. Do I have on my belt? Do I have on the same brown shoes or is one brown and the other one black? This is the time to bring your life into alignment with God's desire for you. Because we are a royal people, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Do you understand what it is to be chosen? When you chose that man or that man chose you, the wedding day came, everything had to be right. Brethren, we are in the preparation for the return of our Savior Jesus Christ. And we ought to be getting our lamps all trimmed and burning in readiness so that when the person at the door announces, the bridegroom is here, all we need to do is stand, make our final adjustment. My tie is right. My hair is cool. I know I don't have hair. <laughs> my eyebrows are all straightened out. My mustache is in order. My beard is trimmed and ready. All I got to do is stand to my feet, break my shoulders back, bravely step to meet the Master. Brethren, let's use these times for preparation, bringing more lives in readiness, remove all animosity, live as though we're in the moment, for we are in the moment. This is the time for preparation. This is the time for getting ready you owe it to yourself to be ready so that when it's announced, behold, the bridegroom comes. All you need to do is jump to your feet, make your final adjustments. As the man announces, go ye out to be him. You go out there, head held high, shoulders back and erect. My master is here and I'm ready to meet him. Not all. Oh, I was fussing with my wife before I left the house. I was fussing with my husband before I left the house. No, you should be in a state of readiness so that when it's announced that the bridegroom is here, you don't just at that meeting up to say, well, I was cursing at the people on the job before I left this Friday. I was fussing with my children before I left the house this morning. That's not the time to make those final adjustments. You will come to the house of God in a state of readiness, saying, yes, Lord, your will be done in me. I am your child. You called me. And in that state of readiness, Every day I live as though it's my life's last. Every moment I live in your presence, 
you know my heart, you know my mind, you know my intent. Deal with me, Lord, as you see fit and best. And when you come to God's house with that attitude, knowing that you are a part of a chosen generation, a holy people, ready to do the will of God. Are you there this morning? If you are, then continue our service knowing that we are ready and prepared for the impending master.